This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. And thank you for joining us today. With me is Richard Fields and John Cameron. Gentlemen, we have... We had a, a topic left over from last week about new research on the link between government and corruption. And I know John was very keen on getting this in this week, so we kind of kicked it over. John, why don't you all give us a, a rundown about what this whole study said? Well, the, uh, let me let me you put me on the spot, why don't you? Uh, I just just for all you the viewers out there, I just woke up from a nap, so it might might take me a while to get going. Um, so. The, we've always known um, intuitively that that uh, any kind of government program uh, is is uh, carved out for the for the benefit of uh, special interest groups, or if it's not carved out for them, that those special interest groups manage to find a way to uh, get an awfully big piece of the pie. And some folks who are all members of the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, one ahead of one of the one of the Federal Reserve uh, areas, and other people who are high up the food chain in the Federal Reserve, I actually decided to to look at the uh, the last big uh, uh, trough filling adventure, which was uh, 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 Barack uh, Hussein's um, Obama uh, attempt to uh, spend people out of recession. Uh, and, and ask the question, do political contributions have any bearing upon uh, how these, uh, the grants that were given out to businesses, there it was grants to try to quote unquote prop up businesses uh, and because of the great recession that the Fed actually caused, which is weird that these people from the Fed are, are doing the study. And it turned out that um, uh, Six percent of the businesses uh, that that six uh, percent of the businesses received grants um, actually gave political contributions, but the, that six percent contribution rate resulted in them getting twenty one percent of the grants given out. So um, you know, there's a nice. Uh, scholastic study by people who have a vested interest in in uh, showing the the government is not corrupt at the Fed, which is the, the biggest corrupter of all, saying categorically that uh, if you give uh, campaign contributions to politicians and uh, money is to be handed out, you're going to get a much bigger share than you would if you didn't. And so I, I thought it was good to see. Um, Two things, that it was from a source that you would normally find pro-deep state, pro-government, pro-politics, which is the Fed. Uh, we could, If we had a two-hour show, we could just have Richard talk about the Fed for a couple hours and how he feels about it, but it's only like a shorter show. Um, you know, the, the, the abomination that's, that uh, started in 1912. And if these people, uh, it's 1912, right, Richard? Yeah. 1913. 1913, yeah. Um, if these people looked at the numbers and came to the conclusion that you give politicians money, uh, you'll you'll get the largesse that's handed out every time they come up with an excuse to grab money from one person and give it to another, then I think we can pretty much take it to the bank, no pun intended. Well, so, well uh, it's interesting. Uh, the uh, you know the where's the statistical uh, correlation that you know done by obviously uh, uh, a source that uh, is unimpeachable in terms of. Uh, uh, coming up with something that's contradictory to what they what their own interests would be, uh, and that's what and, I found know. wonderful about it. That it was, you know, it's kind of like the thieves saying, "Oh yeah, thievery is a, a bad thing." You know, it was it was that yeah. Go ahead, anyway, you, the, the, you know, the the statistics are that uh, if you gave to a political campaign, you had a you had a, political contri contributors got sixty four percent of all of the. Uh, all of the grants and the grants were 10 percent larger than the grants received by non-political contributors so uh, yeah it's you know it's kind of a, a validation of what we've always known it's a pay a pay to play system and if you don't pay good luck uh bill gates from microsoft found that out way back when when uh microsoft was a was a brand new uh company and and, and starting to gain a monopoly 
uh, the, the federal government went after it for uh, being a monopoly. And prior to that, Microsoft had a very minimal lobbying effort. That all changed after the uh, feds went after Microsoft for so-called monopolization of the industry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Go yeah, ahead. Well, businesses you're, you're don't spend. Guy, so. Yeah, well, businesses don't spend money without a return on investment. So they're not going to go giving a bunch of politicians money unless they're getting something in return for it. And that. Yeah, and and if, you, if you look at if you look at the the, the the return on investment in politics, you know it's something like a hundred to one, depending on what study you look at. Mm. What for a political contribution? Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. mine mine aren't doing me any good at all. I don't. I must be given to the wrong party. So uh, <laughs> I, I did give. Yeah, you have to make sure you give to the winner, John. Well, I. Yeah, unless unless we can uh, forcefully enroll, which would violate all the principles I hold near and dear, all people who are uh, small business owners and independent contractors into a union and assess them at the level of. Uh, that the uh, teachers unions assess its folks at uh, it's it's kind of hard to level that playing field, but uh, I think I think the day is the day is coming where you know this great divide between the deep state and those who benefit from uh, forcing uh, paying for their jobs with taxes and forcing parents to take their kids out of the home and put them in the classes so that they can inculcate them with the latest political propaganda. I think those days are coming to an end, despite the, uh, you know, despite the, the efforts of, uh, the efforts of the, the unions. And I was hoping the Janus decision would do something about it, but anyway, and, well, John, and they're, they're huge contributors. There's yeah. been some, uh, some hope in that. In the last week, the SEIU 1000, SEIU local 1000, I think it's the state's, uh, SEIU chapter has replaced their longtime president. The longtime president was 13 years. I forget her name, but she was there for 13 years. It, it was replaced by a by a young man who's said he's going to pull the SEIU out of politics. They're no longer going to play politics. They're just going to service their members. And this is something that those of us who played with the AB5, we kind of maybe saw coming. We saw a lot of union members who were not happy with how AB5 went down and how the unions behaved, how unions simply ignored people. And so it's not actually surprising to me as as it think as as other people. The question is, is it going to hold? James, I have a bridge uh, in the uh, Mojave Desert that crosses a one hundred mile wide river that I would love to sell you if this actually holds. Yeah, yeah that's the question: Is the members going to hold? Because he's well, know, and then that when the guy says, uh, I, I sort of agree with Richard in, in, in that, and the problem with, I mean, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, was dead set against uh, government unions, and he was the big socialist of his time, in, at least on this side of the pond. But you know, Richard and I have, on many shows, have, have uh, had conversations about this, and I'm kind of setting you up for, for a rant, Richard, I think, that anything that anything any negotiation a government union enters into is political. Anything they do is political. Everything they do is political because when they're f fighting for uh, increased wages or benefits, it's basically how's that money going to come to them? They're not going to pay for it. Uh, the, the government is going to go out and take money from people who produce, uh, leaving them with less money to invest in useful capital and give it to these employees. So saying you're going to remove yourself from politics might, they very well might stop supporting political candidates. I doubt it very seriously. I know that they're going to continue to, to redouble their efforts to uh, control the work environment, working conditions, all the rest of that, to maximize the pay for their members, uh, to make sure that nothing but seniority is in place for judging pay and to make it impossible to fire them and to make sure that the gravy train upon retirement is, is as big as it can possibly be. And all of those are political activities. Um, they're lobbying, basically, every time they negotiate. Richard? Yeah, if you're talking about government employees, uh, yeah. you're obviously right. But if, you're, if, I, if I'm not, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the SEIU uh, largely represents government service employees, but it also represents people in the uh, in the like retail industry, mm -hmm. uh, people in the private sector. And there, what they're going to do is try to keep the extant labor laws in, in place. Uh, if they don't, they're uh, quite frankly uh, doing their membership a disservice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. 
No, they'll. They, so when when they say they're going to stay out of politics, they might they might actually stop from um, supporting one political candidate over another. But they're they're still going to be lobbying long and hard, and and, and the results are again every single time they negotiate for the members because of the massive power of government here. Uh, like Richard said, keeping labor laws in place that you know prevent people from coming in as an apprentice or working for below minimum wage or working over 40 hours a week without double time or time and a half or any of these restrictive things that make it difficult for businesses to run. The more flexible work scheduling you do, the easier it is to run a business and more profitable you are. So, you know, even that. So I, it'll be interesting to see how long, how long they, uh, they go without supporting a political candidate. And then uh, let's let's look because this is public disclosure stuff, violation of First Amendment, but it's public disclosure where their campaign contributions go because you know they're going to make them. If they stop making them, I would be I'm going to buy you the best meal that I can buy for like twelve, thirteen dollars, James. Yeah, the uh, big, uh, the making. large the large meal at a drive-up window, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's well, it's nice to see that they were actually thinking about members other than. You know the Democratic Party members. Essentially, it's what he said. By focusing on the Democratic Party, we were ignoring half of our members, and so we were going to get out of party politics. Maybe I should have been clear that he was mm -hmm. wanting to get it out of party politics. Now I don't think it's actually going to hold because their membership is their membership. We'll see who shows up at the next election mm -hmm. meeting, and that's yeah. you know you know how that how that goes. Yeah. So we'll see how it holds. But there's a there's some hope there that at least even if the SEIU starting to recognize that they can't be so hardcore political maybe you know there is a little bit of hope maybe we're starting to we've gone past the darkest times of the night and we're starting to kind of start to see the light of day you know maybe a little bit of hope but then again richard maybe not a little bit of hope apparently they're trying to mess with the credit card fees stressed again <laughs> yeah this is at the national level uh there's something called the uh uh the uh, the durban amendment which uh, which uh, I think was part of, uh, of uh, a financial uh, uh, reform, so-called movement, a few years ago, which uh, made it uh, difficult for banks to uh, charge whatever they wanted to for credit card fees, the one or two or three percent transaction fee that they charge retailers. And what is happening now uh, in uh, a uh, uh, a replay of the Durban Amendment is they're trying to lower or even eliminate the fees that credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, uh, the, the banks can charge for processing those uh, transactions. Uh, and, and the charge right now is going to retailers. So when you pay uh, $100 to a retailer for a transaction, 3% of that goes to a Visa uh, or 2%, depending on what kind of a contract they have with, with, uh, with the bank. Uh, but going forward, they're trying to reduce that more now, what the, what you know, the, the credit card companies or the banks in this case, they have to make money somehow. And if they have to spend or if they're making less on the on the processing fees for uh, credit card transactions, they're going to make it up somewhere. They're going to pay less on if they, if they can pay less on savings account uh, interest rates. It's already down to almost to, to nearly zero. Mm -hmm. uh, credit card uh, rewards programs are going to be uh, become less. Uh, uh, less uh, attractive. Uh, you're going to see the uh, foreign transaction fee come back uh, or, or be increased in where, where, the, where it still exists. Uh, the, the point is there is no such thing as a free lunch mm -hmm. and there's no such thing as a free service. Mm -hmm. And what the politicians are trying to do for the retailers, the retailers are the lobbyists in this case, what they're trying to do is give the retailers a free lunch. In other words, make cash transaction uh, no more, no more beneficial than uh, credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. Politicians would love to see everything be a credit card or debit card transaction because then they can track that, track the money a lot more careful, a lot more uh, stringently. Uh, read IRS. So, uh, so they're they're in favor of it. But the point is, what we're, what really should happen in in the best of all po possible worlds is there should be no regulation whatsoever on the relationship between retailers, banks, and consumers on who pays the fees. It should be left to the market. Absolutely well, the agree. Yeah. yeah, the consumer pays the fee anyway. The end, the end consumer pays all, all costs. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're, ju you're just kind of shifting around 
how you see that cost come out, whether you see it come out from your credit card statement on an extra fee or whether you see it go on your Snickers bar costing an extra five cents. It, the end consumer is going to pay it regardless. And so having politicians make that decision is actually what leads to the corruption that we've been talking about here all day. It's, it's just another way for politicians to, you know, create benefits for those who give them campaign contributions. And as we've seen, even, you know, in my own race, we've seen it where people will give hundreds of thousands of dollars to a campaign that doesn't need it. And it's, you know, why? Eh, it's because it pays off. It's clearly it does. And back to a point Richard made that, that you know, the, 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 like this whole thing about the independent contractors, was that EB-5? I always get the numbers confused. The, yeah, well, the the EB-5, and was, then there was a cleanup bill that's a disaster yeah. as well. But, yeah. So every every time a politician says that they're doing something to benefit the public good, what you need to do is drill down and find out what they're really doing. And in every case, it's it's uh, putting people in a position where they're, they're uh, going to be tracked more, taxed, or, or taxed more. And that's what AB5 was all about. Uh, and then also, typically people who work full-time uh, are more likely, and not independent countries, much more likely to be union members, which will give to government and promote government, more government rather than less. And, and tracking cash uh, or tracking transactions and getting away from cash, uh, you, yeah, I ask small businesses flat out when I deal with them, uh, what's easier for you, cash or credit card? And the answer is, Richard, I'll let you answer this question. What's I want to guess cash for a small business. Yeah, cash is much easier. Much and easier. less expensive because you don't have to pay that fee. Yeah, yeah. And then, all you know, and, and, and the fees really, uh, the, if there's a problem with fees and why small business is much more likely to uh, uh, be more in favor of cash transactions, I mean, cash transactions – Handling cash, getting the, the guard truck to come pick it up, having your managers drop off a cash deposit, all puts you at risk, pilferage, all the rest of that. It's much easier. There are some, there are some benefits to doing non-cash even at the restaurant point. Um, it's, it's harder to steal when people aren't passing cash over the till. You know, and, but, you know, the problem is, is that, that large, uh, large companies can negotiate with a little stronger arm about the fees they pay. There are some massive companies that I'm willing to bet pay a fraction of that 3% that you're talking about. I'll bet you. Yeah. Target, have you, have you ever wondered? Pay. Yeah. Target have you ever wondered? Pay. Have you ever wondered why Costco only accepts one credit card? It switched yeah. from American Express to Visa recently. Can yeah. you guess why that might be that they're yeah. maybe getting a lower, uh, transaction fee from Visa than that we're getting from American Express. I, yeah. I guarantee you that's what's happening. Oh, it's that's what's not, happening. That's, why whenever yeah, that's, I, not, that's not taking place at, at Joe's Barbecue. No, I show up and I, I buy, I spend $600 typically when I go to Costco. And they ask me why there's three of us in the house and one dog who doesn't eat all that much. But I spend $600 every six weeks there. And so I always pull out uh, a... a uh, MasterCard. And they say, I want to take MasterCard. I said, no, this is this is a debit card. I take anybody's debit card. And I think that gives you two messages. One, you know, Visa has cut cut them the best rate. Because you know, uh, uh, was American Express is is despised by merchants because they charge exorbitant fees compared to other people. Flat off the top, they're always the most expensive. Um, the other thing to tell, let you know that most people who shop at Costco buy their stuff on credit. You might pay it off at the end of every month, but the initial transaction is a credit transaction because they're always surprised when I when I make a you know relatively large purchase with a debit card. But anyway, we're going sideways. We've got some more ground to cover, and I'm taking it sideways. I'm it. Yeah. Well, we'll go back to some more corruption. Um, out of the Guardian this last week, we told a story about an ice cream owner who tried and failed to start an ice cream shop in San Francisco. He's two hundred thousand dollars in debt and didn't even get his his store open. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how absurd the the bureaucratic red tape here in California and especially down in San Francisco is. Is that you spent two hundred thousand dollars to try to open an, an ice cream store for God's sake, and he never got the store open, and he's now he's two hundred thousand dollars in debt. 
and no one's going to talk about the risk he took to try and, and get that store open. But it's, well, actually, it doesn't, doesn't. The stories didn't say he was in debt. I think he had the two hundred thousand dollars. The problem, the, the the massive problem, is problem after problem after problem. It is exciting to know that his uh, if you even if he passed the permit process, which takes forever, and he had to get permits from I think seventeen different organizations to open the thing, he still is is open to his uh, neighbors, some of them competitors voting to not give him permission to start a business. There was a, a uh, another ice cream store that said, no, 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 we don't need another ice cream store. Yeah, it's, it's and, called the, and, the, it's called the, uh, the competitor's veto. And it's uh, endemic in, uh, in California and states like California yeah. and, uh, you know, across the country. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are uh, laws that prevent competitors from coming into the marketplace unless the existing uh, businesses give them the okay, which of course they never do. The moving industry, the hospital yeah. industry, uh, and I didn't and even know it. Industry. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't even know it. it applied, for God's sake, to the ice cream industry. But there you go. Well, I'm I'm shocked that 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 uh, that the nanny state of San Francisco. Now, if you wanted to open up a, a feces store there, you could you could probably do that because they have plenty of supply on the sidewalks with the homeless population, but. Uh, and apparently those are those those are un, uh, unregulated unregulated environments. But if if that ice cream store, I'm surprised that Nanny State uh, didn't just decide no. If it was uh, frozen yogurt or or something that's uh, non-GMO with the low fat content, and it will allow it. But everybody knows that ice cream is is bad, um, and you know it's high in saturated fat and. That'll lead to heart attacks, and, and uh, it doesn't service disparate populations, and on and on and on. Um, but it's that that one story is, is uh, that's that's why I like that 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 organization, the Guardian. Uh, they, uh, you know, why couldn't somebody like the San Francisco Chronicle or somebody like that write the story? Uh, it's it's pretty interesting that uh, in this day and age, it can be impossible to open a store. To sell ice cream. Yeah. Well, and they wonder why life is so expensive. It's a perfect example of how everything is so expensive here in California. Well, if it takes two hundred thousand dollars to not open a store, <laughs> how much does it take to actually get a store open? Mm -hmm. So, how much is your ice cream going to cost to pay for all that? I mean, who's paying for all that? Someone has to pay for Me that. Meanwhile, the, yeah. Meanwhile, the existing ice cream store is charging monopoly prices. You can mm -hmm. bet. Well, yeah. and apparently there was a there was a a viral protest against that uh, store where they asked people to not do business with them, and uh, that 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 has that has power. You know, the, these little protests where people in the neighborhood refuse to do business with a store and basically shame them into changing their behaviors that actually works. It doesn't take uh, it doesn't take <clears throat> too many weeks of an empty storefront or orders being down by fifty percent for uh, for the person to at least pretend to put on a different front. So it was it was nice to see that uh, that the consumers in the area understood that uh, you know they should have a voice in what kind of what kind of goods and services are offered to them. That's that's an interesting thing. All right, with a few minutes left, we're gonna we got one more thing we we'll want to cover. California's once exceptional public education system has been kind of taken over by extremists, uh, politicalized extremists. We're seeing it in critical race theory being implemented in schools and uh, these various kind of, uh, oh, shall we say, non-inclusive policies, I guess is a way to describe them. Uh, what do you guys think? It is, as I don't well, have kids in the school, so it's kind of hard for us to, we're all old now and I don't have you know kids in school, so it's hard for me to, Care. All you got to do is look at the, at the numbers. 50% uh, of uh, students don't meet the math standards set by the schools, and you can bet that's a low bar to begin with. 40% of students don't meet the uh, math, math stand. I'm sorry, the English standards is 50%. Uh, 40% don't meet the math standards. Uh, you know, and the standards are low, and the teachers teach to the test. Uh, when you close the schools for a year. In most, in many cases, because of a because of a, of a virus that presents very little danger to students in the first place, what do you expect? And when you are teaching critical race theory, and teaching uh, 
1619 project and teaching all kinds of other uh, politically correct but useless information, what do you expect to happen to people's ability to actually learn math and English and uh, other useful skills? And it's even worse. It's even worse for people of color, for poor people. Rich people have always had the option to take their kids out of public schools and put them in private schools. Rich people like teachers, uh, teachers in the state of California, I think over a 50 percent rate. Uh, put their kids into private schools. And in the L.A. school district, one of the worst school districts in the country that turns out uh, people who read <coughs> four or five grade levels behind what they're supposed to, especially black, Hispanic, and uh, certain sub-Asian groups, um, I think it's 60% of the teachers put their kids in private schools. But, you know, it, that's because that's they're rich people and they can afford to do that. Uh, the time of the voucher has come or the tax credit or the, the, the tax supported scholarship, whatever it is, um, you know, give me a tax credit to, that I can use and, and buy my child's education somewhere else. And uh, it's even worse because the, the uh, uh, universities in the state of California are no longer doing the ACT or the SAT test because uh, then they can rely on the GPA from schools and they've already set it up to where they have to accept uh, uh, the, the highest, like 5% of the people from a high school in GPA, when that GPA very well might be rewarded for something like a uh, basket observation or uh, a, a, a treatise that is completely subjective on critical race theory. Um, so it's, it's gotten worse. And the, the, uh, this is one good thing that uh, it kind of in the ballpark. The state bar has, uh, has uh, just dropped the passing rate by 50 points uh, so that even more shysters can, can practice bad law in the state of California. So uh, that, uh, I hate to close on that note. Somebody say something good. Well, I don't know if I can say anything good. When you focus on social engineering, you're gonna, not going to get education. You're going to mm -hmm. get whatever the politicians or the social engineers want you to know. And that because is about, you're going to get a bunch of angry people, or angry kids when they grow up and figure out they can't make a living doing it. Well, they can't they make a living and that they haven't been educated. The people have been lying to them. The, the people who are supposed to be there protecting them have been lying to them and they're going to be angry. Why wouldn't they be? And that is all the time we have. Thank you for watching. You can visit us at libertariancounterpoint.com and get all our show notes. Um, and from all those of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching and please remember to love everybody. Thank you very much, James. Thank you, John. James. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 p.m. And each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.